Your creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry. Then from north to south and east to west, we'd hear Christ be magnified. Were the whole earth echoing his eminence, his name would burst from sea and sky. From rivers to the mountain tops, we'd hear Christ be magnified. Come on, sing this chorus with us. Oh, Christ be magnified. Just let his praise arise. Christ be magnified. If I had to describe GCF in one word, it would be caring. Authentic. Family. Community. GCF in one word. Family. Fun. Belonging. Community. Community. Gracious. Resurrection. Family. GCF is the best family. GCF to me is home. Good morning. Welcome to GCF Vineyard of Wilmore. My name is Leanne Williams and I am the pastor of Outreach. So excited to welcome you today to this online worship platform. We hope that you've come ready to experience the Holy Spirit in a real and powerful way right where you're at. But before we get started with worship, just a couple quick reminders. At this moment, you'll probably see that one of our staff members is posting in the comments two links. The first of these is our eWeekly. An eWeekly is just like a bulletin in live church. If you want to click on that, you can peruse through and learn a little bit more about what GCF has to offer. The second of these links is our eConnect card. We would love it if everyone in attendance on the worship platform would click on that, fill it out, and submit it. This is a great way for our staff to be able to greet our guests and our visitors later this week. It's also a fabulous place to submit any prayer requests that you have that you would like for our staff and elders to pray over together. At the end of service, you'll see that another staff member will drop a third link into the comments. This link is for our prayer ministry. If you would like to receive prayer ministry this morning, you can click on that link at the end of service and you'll be redirected into a private Zoom prayer room with one of our prayer ministers. Okay, before we get started with worship this morning, Pastor Ronjo asked me to share something special with you guys. We would love to see you worshiping. So could you do us a favor and during the first few songs of worship this morning, take a quick picture of your family worshiping together. Post it on your Facebook page and be sure to tag GCF Vineyard of Wilmore as well as to use the hashtag GCF Worship. All right, we look forward to seeing all of your pictures. Let's get started with a word of prayer. Father God, you are so amazing. We are so blessed to be able to come together as your people here this morning, right here in Wilmore, across Jessamine County, across Kentucky, and even around the world. We thank you for each and every family that has joined us this morning for um, every person that is here, Lord, we pray that you would just bring blessings into their homes and that the Holy Spirit would come and dwell with them. Lord, we pray that you would um, open our hearts and our minds to the hearing and the receiving of your word. And Father, that because of that, we would become a transformed people, not just for ourselves, but for ministry to and in the world. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ and all of God's people said, Amen. Good morning, I'm Katie and this is my husband Mike and we are so excited that you are joining us here in our home with our kiddos to worship Jesus with just a little bit of music this morning.
you, Jesus. Good morning, GCF Church. Um, I will be singing I Will Exalt this morning. If you all would please join me in worship. Your presence 
morning, everyone. Kids, today we are all super agents. We are going to be learning about a very important mission. This mission is called the Great Commission, and it was given to the disciples by Jesus, and it is still the mission that we have for us today. So grab your packet, and you'll find your own fun glasses in there, and let's get started learning about what this mission has for us to do. Hey, good morning, uh, GCF. Uh, we are continuing this morning uh, in the series we started a few weeks ago called Practicing the Way of Jesus, uh, where we're taking a look at uh, many of the different parts of the, the longest teaching that Jesus did uh, with his disciples, uh, with his uh, students. And uh, I just want to give you a heads up this morning. We're going to be dealing with uh, a passage in Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 30, uh, where Jesus talks about adultery and lust. Um, I would say that this message is going to be PG some parental guidance required. So if you have kids that are typically in the kids zone or pre-kids zone on Sunday morning, you'll just want to be uh, aware of that. And if you have kids who are teenagers, I think there's probably some stuff uh, in this message that would be good for them to hear uh, and to, uh, to learn about uh, this morning. So just that heads up before we get started, and I want to pray. Uh, Father, I just want to ask right now that you would saturate me with your uh, Holy Spirit. I want to be able to teach the words of Jesus, our teacher, in a way that is true to him, in a way that is faithful to him, and in a way that helps all of us uh, uh, be his students and learn from him and follow in his ways. And even as, as I ask you, Father, to saturate me with your Holy Spirit, I ask that you would saturate each and every person uh, in the place where they're listening this morning, um, that we would not only just hear what Jesus has to say this morning and hear about the things that Jesus has to say, but that we would be true, that, that you would help us to truly listen, that what we learn uh, would impact our mind, impact our hearts in such a way that you uh, transform us and that you conform us uh, to the image of Jesus. We, we want to be better students, and so we ask you, Holy Spirit, to fall on us and help us to do that. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Jesus never had sex. And yet Jesus did, on a couple of occasions, teach about sex. Now, before we talk about what Jesus did teach about sex, it's important for us to remember that at one point uh, in his teaching, Jesus said to his students, um, I have not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but I have come to fulfill the law and the prophets. And the law and the prophets was Jesus' way. It was a way that many of the, the first century Jews referred to the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. So when it comes to the topic of sex, it's important for us to remember that Jesus honored the entirety of the Old Testament. He uh, believed the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, and that means that we can say two things uh, about what Jesus thought about um, sex. The first thing is we can say that that means that Jesus believed, as the, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures taught, that, that sex was uh, an act reserved for two people, a man and a woman, in a committed relationship that is bound by the vows and the bonds of marriage. So Jesus obviously believed that because he was a Jew who believed the Old Testament scriptures. Uh, but there's also a passage in the Old Testament in the Hebrew Bible or a lengthy poem that is called the Song of Songs. And the Song of Songs is this amazing poem written between a man and a woman, two lovers, um, about the, uh, the nature of their sexual relationship, this beautiful, good, erotic, enjoyable sexual relationship that they share together. And so while Jesus believed 
that sex was to be reserved for uh, a committed relationship between a man and a woman, Jesus also believed that sex was a good, beautiful, erotic thing that was intended for the enjoyment uh, and the satisfaction of a man and a woman in a committed relationship to help them ever increase their, their, their bonds of intimacy, their emotional bonds, their spiritual bonds, and their physical bonds together. Now, it's also important for us to remember that Jesus' students, his first students, were a handful of men of various ages. And Jesus had challenged these men to leave their homes and their families for a time to follow him as a band of, of students all over uh, the nation of Israel. And this meant that oftentimes they were going to be away from their spouses and they were going to be in places where they were encountering hundreds, if not thousands of women that they had never met before. And we know that Jesus would often in his ministry interact with tax collectors and prostitutes and people who did not have high uh, sexual moral standards. And so it's really important as Jesus takes these men away from their homes for a while and their families for a while to travel as a band of his students around Israel that he deals with the issue of sex because they're going to be dealing with sexual temptations probably more than they ever have before because of the context they're going to be in in following Jesus. So it was also really important for Jesus to teach his students about sex. Equally important for Jesus to teach us, his students, today about sex because we live in such a hyper-sexualized culture where our sexual standards are all messed up and don't necessarily hold up or live up to the standards that, that God has set for us as his children that Jesus uh, sets for us as his students. So what does Jesus teach about sex? Well, the first thing Jesus does is to go back to the, the Ten Commandments, the Ten Fundamental Commandments that God gave to the people of Israel, and uh, Jesus quotes the Seventh Commandment, which he, Jesus says this, "'You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery.'" Now, adultery referred to any sexual kind of relationship or sexual act that took place outside of the confines of a marriage between a man and a woman. Now, that did not mean that if you weren't married, you could have a sexual relationship with whoever you wanted to, and that counted as okay, that that didn't count as adultery. The commandment against adultery basically said that the only proper place for any kind of sexual relationship to take place is between a man and a woman who are in a committed marriage relationship with one another. Now, it's really interesting because the, the, the teachers of the law in Jesus' day, they took the seventh commandment, the commandment against adultery, and they set it sort of as a, as a, a benchmark. Uh, and, and they would say, and, and what that meant is that if you have the seventh commandment, the commandment against adultery sort of up here, that meant that the, the teachers of the religious law and other men of the day were saying, well, that actually means there's a whole host of other sort of sexual activities that you can participate in that actually don't count as a violation of the seventh commandment, because to violate the seventh commandment, you have to have a physical sexual relationship with another person. And that would mean that, hey, uh, sexual fantasies are okay an explicit sexual conversation with a couple of the guys or a couple of the, the ladies, that would be okay. Maybe even masturbation would be okay because none of that rose to the level of violating the seventh commandment, which was a commandment against uh, actually having a physical sexual relationship with someone. So they said, hey, all sorts of sexual activities are fine. You haven't been disobedient. You haven't violated the commandment unless you actually have a physical sexual relationship with another person. Well, Jesus obviously has some issues with this, and we know that he does because after he's repeated the seventh commandment, Jesus adds his, sort of his own lesson, his own law, his own rule for his students. So Jesus says this, but I, he says, you have heard it, it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Then he adds, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in his heart. Now, Jesus in the first century is, is teaching in a culture that was a highly patriarchal culture. That means a male-dominated culture. Uh, and so Jesus aims a lot of his, aims his teaching at sex on men because men were in charge of sexual relationships. Remember his closest students that he's concerned about here were all men. 
Um, but it's important for us to remember that today we don't live in a culture that is as highly patriarchal as dominated by men as that culture was. We live in a culture where men and women are more equal. So even though Jesus is talking primarily to men here, it's important for us to remember that what he's saying today applies equally to men and women in a, in a culture that has more equality between the two sexes um, as ours does. So Jesus says, hey, I tell you, whoever looks at a woman lustfully has committed adultery in her heart. Now, you may be saying, wow, could G does, does Jesus even know what he's talking about? How could he set a standard that high? There is no way that I, as a human being, student of Jesus or not, could ever meet a standard where I don't ever have a sexual fault. Well, before you just give up on what Jesus is teaching here and tune him out, let's dig a little bit deeper into this because Jesus is talking about a lustful look, lustful thoughts. And in other words, what Jesus is talking about is the kind of glance that you, or the kind of sort of staring or ogling or leering that you might do at a person of the opposite sex, where you are ingraining an image of them, emblazoning an image of them into your mind and your heart, so that at some point in time later on when you're by yourself, you can sort of turn that person into a prostitute in your mind and your heart to be used in your fantasies for all of, of, of your, to, to sort of process or inflame your physical passions and your sexual desires. So that's the kind of look that Jesus is talking about. Jesus is not talking about the kind of glance or the kind of look where you notice that a woman or a man is particularly attractive or particularly beautiful. We were all, students of Jesus or not, created to appreciate beauty. And so there's nothing wrong with appreciating beauty, with appreciating things that are attractive to us. Jesus is saying the problem here is when you emblazon or ingrain that image in your mind or your heart, so that later on you can turn the image of that person in your mind, turn them sort of into a prostitute for, for the life of your mind, to fulfill your sexual fantasies uh, in your mind. Now, um, the word lust, when Jesus says a lustful look, Jesus is speaking Greek. And the Greek word that gets translated as lust in English is the same Greek word that was often used to describe covetousness or coveting. Now, covetousness or coveting is kind of an old English word. It refers to indulging a desire for something that you do not already have or own, particularly if it is if you're you're indulging a desire for something that someone else owns or that someone else has. Now, if you know the Ten Commandments, you may know that the Seventh Commandment says you shouldn't commit adultery, but there's a Tenth Commandment. And this Tenth Commandment is all about coveting. And in the Tenth Commandment says, uh, you, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. In other words, Jesus is saying that, that that commandment says, you should not lust after your neighbor's house. You should not lust after your neighbor's wife. Well, here you have the religious teachers of the law in Jesus' day saying, hey, you can indulge all sorts of lusts and fantasies and, phys and, and desires, but so long as you don't enter into a physical sexual relationship, you haven't violated the seventh commandment. And Jesus is kind of pointing out, hey, you can maybe obey the seventh physical, the, the, the seventh commandment about not committing adultery, but you can't celebrate the fact that you've not committed uh, adultery or that you haven't violated the seventh commandment while breaking the tenth commandment. So if you are saying, hey, I haven't had, I haven't had a, a committed adultery, I haven't had a physical sexual relationship with someone, but you've got a mind that is full of fantasies and sexual desires that you're indulging in your mind and you're feeding in your mind, Jesus is like, well, but you've violated the Tenth Commandment. All of that to say that if you are a student of Jesus, you can't celebrate obeying one commandment, say the Seventh Commandment, by actually violating another commandment. If you violate one commandment, the, the Tenth Commandment in coveting, then it renders your, your obedience to the Seventh Commandment. That's just sort of messed up. That won't work. That's a type of hypocrisy that Jesus says you just can't have if you are one of his students. I think Jesus also wants to point out the ludicrousness of saying, hey, I am sexually pure. My body is sexually pure because I have not had a physical sexual relationship with another person. 
But if you've got a heart that is full of fantasies and lust and desires, well, your heart is a part of you. You, 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 you. Your body can't be pure simply because you haven't had a physical sexual relationship inappropriately if your heart is full of thoughts and desires and fantasies about an inappropriate sexual relationship. The heart for Jesus and for all of the ancient uh, Jewish people, the ancient Hebrews, the heart did not necessarily refer to an organ so much as it referred to the place inside of the human being being uh, that, that where, where the thoughts dwelt, where the emotions dwelt, the part of the human being, that place in us that wills and desires and chooses what we will do in life. And Jesus is saying, hey, if, if your heart is full of sexual desires and fantasies, your heart is a part of who you are physically. It, it's inside of you. So if your heart is impure, with, is full of impure sexual thoughts, then your body is already sexually impure, whether or not you have had a, a physical sexual relationship uh, inappropriately. And, and sort of like when we talk about someone is diagnosed with cancer today, we know that they will often be diagnosed with cancer of a particular part of the body, say lung cancer. But the person who has cancer knows that the cancer that is in their lungs is going to impact their whole body. And, and the idea for Jesus with sex is that if you've got impure sexual desires in your heart, then your whole body is full of sexual impurity or is impacted by that sexual impurity. Now, Jesus talks a lot uh, about the heart. Um, there's another place in one of his uh, teachings where Jesus says, a, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. In other words, Jesus is saying what you feed your heart so that that then dwells in your heart, your heart will then impact what you do with, with your body. Um, so that if you are filling your heart with sexual images and sexual fantasies, then your heart is actually going to drive your body to consume more sexual images, more sexual imagery, more inappropriate imagery, uh, because you're conditioning your heart to want more of those things. In some cases, and Jesus is well aware of this, that very few people end up committing actual physical adultery with another person if they haven't first sort of filled their heart with lustful thoughts and images uh, and fantasies of, of other people. And so the whole idea that Jesus is getting at here is that your body, your body will follow your heart wherever your heart goes. So if your heart is already in a place where it is full of sexual fantasies, where you are committing adultery in the heart, then your body is sure to follow your heart wherever your heart already is. Your body will follow your, your body will go wherever your heart already is is. And so the way of Jesus, the way of Jesus is the way of purity. And that means that you have to guard your heart because your body will follow your heart wherever your heart has already gone. Now, one of the great things about Jesus as a teacher is that he never says, hey, you shouldn't do this without also telling you what you should do instead. If you are a teacher or if you have children, you know that if you tell your child or your student not to do something, the thing that you've told them not to do is probably the thing that they're gonna do. But if you tell your, your student or your child not to do something, but then you tell them what you want them to do, they're more apt not to do the thing that they shouldn't do because you've given them a thing that they should do. And Jesus almost always, when he tells us that we shouldn't do something like you shouldn't commit adultery in your heart, Jesus counters that by telling us what we should do. And so Jesus does that in his teaching on sex. Jesus puts it this way, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Jesus is then going to repeat that, that same statement, but instead of the right eye, he's going to replace it with the right hand. Why the eyes and the hands? Because the eyes and the hands are the primary instruments of the body that are involved in sexual fantasies and, and of course, acting personally, physically upon those sexual fantasies. So Jesus, obviously, when he says this, he's, he's speaking uh, what they say hyperbol hyperbolically. He's making a, 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 an extreme statement to get 
get a point across. So Jesus literally is not saying that if you have, if your your eye is is leering at someone lustfully, that you should gouge your eye out. He's not saying you should cut your hand off if you if your hand is constantly taking you to pornography or helping you follow through on your sexual fantasies. He's not saying that at all. But he does mean to say with this example that we all as his students need to realize how dangerous indulging our sexual fantasies can be, how dangerous it can be for us as the students of Jesus to let our eyes to participate in lustful looks and to fill our heart with that stuff, how dangerous it can be for us to use our hands to act upon those, uh, the, the, those fantasies and to satisfy those fantasies uh, physically. So again, Jesus doesn't mean literally we should gouge out our eye or that we should literally cut off our hand if we're having an issue with sexual lust and sexual fantasies. What Jesus does mean is that when your eye or your hand start to fill your heart with sexual fantasies and lust, you need to take immediate decisive action to set your eyes and your hands up on things that are pure and beneficial. So guard your heart by setting your eyes and your hands on things that are pure and beneficial. So the way of Jesus is the way of purity. The way of Jesus is the way of sexual purity. And since your heart, or let me put it this way, since your body will follow your heart wherever your heart goes, if you are a student of Jesus, you must guard your heart heart. Now, some of you may remember uh, from high school having to read uh, uh, one of the books by the two Bronte sisters. Uh, I can't remember. I think I remember exactly which one it was. You may remember having to read Jane Eyre. Um, if you were, uh, if you're a lady, you, you may remember the novel Jane Eyre somewhat fondly. If you were a guy, you may remember Jane Eyre be in high school because you couldn't wait to get finished with it. It is uh, Jane Eyre, pretty much anything that the Bronte sisters wrote, not really what you would call uh, must read novels or must read books for those of of us who are guys. But there's a point, Jane, Jane Eyre is a single woman, and she is selected at one point uh, in the novel to go and be a governess uh, at Moore House, which is in northern England, and Moore House is owned by a fella uh, whose last name is Rochester. And um, uh, Rochester is still married. His wife is sort of an enigmatic, mysterious figure. You find out later in the novel that she actually suffers from mental illness. But Rochester is still married. And Jane knows that Rochester is married, but she doesn't know a whole lot about his wife. But there develops this intense romance and this intense, passionate relationship between Rochester and Jane Eyre. Both of them know that they should not act upon the sexual desires that they, that they, they feel for each other. But there comes a point in the novel where Rochester can't control himself anymore. And so he grasps Jane in his arms and he begs Jane Eyre to become his mistress. And this, this in the novel, it is a moment of intense, intense romance and intense physical desire. And in the novel, um, we are given this look. Jane uh, tells us what is going on in her heart as she is in the arms of Rochester, this man that she is wants to be romantically involved with, this man that she wants to have a sexual relationship with. And so here's what, what, what Jane says about what is going on in her heart in that moment. She says, while he spoke, my very conscience and reason turned traitors against me and charged me with crime in resisting him. They spoke as loud as feeling and that clamored wildly. Oh, comply, it said. Think of his misery. Think of his danger. Look at his state when left alone. Remember his headlong nature. Consider the recklessness following on despair. Soothe him. Save him. Love him. Tell him you love him and will be his. Who in the world cares for you or who will be injured by what you do? And so everything in Jane's heart in that moment is saying, be involved in this sexual relationship with him. Think about how much he needs it. Think about how much you need it. Think about how much you need this relationship. And what will it matter if you have this relationship anyway? And in the midst of Jane's heart experiencing all of those things, her heart then turns and Jane begins to take these steps to guard her heart from uh, the lust that she's feeling, from the lust that Rochester is feeling for her. And so here's what, what then begins to happen in her heart. Still indomitable was the reply. I care for myself. 
The more solitary, the more friendless, the more unsustained I am, the more I will respect myself. I will keep the law given by God, sanctioned by man. I will hold to the principles received by me when I was sane and not mad as I am now. Laws and principles are not for the times when there is no temptation. They are for such moments as this, when body and soul rise in mutiny against their rigor. Stringent are they, inviolate they shall be. If at my individual conscience I might break them, what would be their worth? They have a worth, so I have always believed, and if I cannot believe it now, it is because I am insane, quite insane, with my veins running fire and my heart beating faster than I can count its throbs. Preconceived opinions, foregone determinations are all I have at this hour to stand by. There I plant my feet." And so Jane is in the midst of this moment of experiencing this intense sexual desire, this intense sexual passion. But in the midst of that, instead of indulging it, she moves to this place where she's guarding her heart and she's saying, wait a minute, there are things I believe as a, as a follower of Jesus. There are things I believe that are as a human being. And even though I may be lonely, even though there may not be a man who has claimed me as his own, I will respect myself. I will respect what I believe. I will do what my faith has taught me to do and what my faith is telling me to do. And if I act as if they don't matter in this moment, then they can never, ever matter again. And Jane takes these incredible steps to guard her heart. Now, I su suppose that in the course of human history, there have been some people like Jane, who in the midst of an intense temptation, in the midst of a, a moment of intense sexual passion and desire, who can actually um, begin to guard their heart in that moment and turn away from that moment as, as Jane does in that moment. Uh, I suppose there have been some people like that, but Jane Eyre is a character in a novel, not a real person. And the reality is that most of us in the hypersexualized culture we live in, if we allow ourselves to end up in a moment of intense passion and, in, and intense temptation like that, it will just simply be too late for us to do something to guard our heart. We have to start earlier than that in guarding our heart. And that's what Jesus is telling us. The way of Jesus is the way of sexual purity. Your body will follow your heart wherever it goes, so guard your heart. And for most of us, that is going to mean that the first time we see someone who is attractive and we begin to think, oh, what would it be like to have sex with that person? We can't go any further than that. In that moment, we have to set our eyes upon something else. The first time that we think think our hand is going to get on the phone or the laptop or the tablet and take us toward pornography, we have to stop right there and set our hand towards something productive. And it can be just about anything. If you are, are beginning to indulge fantasies in the middle of the night, get up and go wash the dishes. If you're indulging fantasies in the middle of the day, get up and go work on a home repair project. Get up and go for a drive in the country. Call a friend. Confess the sexual fantasies that are beginning to plague you and beginning to end up in your mind so that you can get help from someone else. It is so important for us to guard our hearts because our bodies will follow our hearts wherever they go. And the way of Jesus is the way of purity. If we are the students of Jesus, we guard our hearts so that our bodies follow our hearts in the ways of purity. Now, I want to add just two final things here. The first thing is this. If you are addicted to pornography, if you are addicted to sex, Jesus' advice is good advice for you. But if you have become addicted to those things, it is no longer just habitual for you. It's not some, in other words, what you have done, the more you have participated in, in pornography or, or improper sexual activities, you have actually been reworking the neural pathways in your brain so that you have created in your brain a proclivity to continue to indulge in pornography and sexual activity. And Jesus' advice, his teaching here is great teaching for you, but the chances are, as a matter of fact, I'd say there really are very few chances, very little chance, that you will be able to follow in the ways of Jesus here without getting help from good friends and probably even help from a pastor or professional help from a counselor who can help you go through the process of following the ways of Jesus so that over that process you can begin renewing 
renewing your brain and reshaping your brain toward things that are good and pure and beneficial for you. The second and final thing I just want to say to this is if you are someone who struggles with fantasies, if you are someone who has not uh, who, who has sexual impurity in your mind and your heart or who has participated in uh, an inappropriate sexual relationship with someone else. Jesus is not ruling you out. Jesus is not saying you are impure, therefore you cannot be my student. That's not at all what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, I want you to bring everything that you have to me. I want you to be my student, and I am going to teach you the way of purity. I'm going to help you do this. I'm going to show you how to do this. Why? Because Jesus is not a drill sergeant. Jesus is a teacher. He is a good teacher. And he goes before us and he walks beside of us to teach us how to follow in his ways, even if sexual impurity has been a part of our experience. So the way of Jesus is the way of purity. Because your body will follow your heart wherever you, your heart goes. If you are a student of Jesus, then guard your heart. Father, I just want to ask... Uh, right now, that for those uh, who have some degree of sexual impurity in their life, I pray that you would move in the power of your Holy Spirit to help them with that right now. I ask that you would speak to them very clearly about how they are to move forward dealing with the sexual impurity uh, that they are wrestling with, that they have been struggling with. Whatever that may be, Father, speak to them clearly, speak to them graciously, so that they can take the steps that they need to take, so that they can do what you, Lord Jesus, are teaching them to do in this moment in regard to the way of purity and the, and the way of following you. Uh, Father, I wanna, I wanna ask that you would bless all of us this week with the ability and the power of your spirit to guard our hearts from the things that would sabotage us or draw us away from walking in the ways of Jesus. And I ask this in his name, amen. So um, it's been about two weeks ago now uh, that we uh, lost Ike Adams, uh, that he passed on. Uh, and uh, Ike was so important to so many of you. Uh, when we announced his death, so many of you responded on Facebook and responded in an email saying things like, Ike was the first person who greeted us when we came to GCF. Ike then never forgot who we were. Ike always treated us like he had known us forever. So many things that so many of you said about how Ike had impacted your life, even if you didn't know him as a, as a deep friend or a good friend. And some of you, of course, knew him as a deep friend, a good friend, um, and uh, as someone whose walk with, with Jesus was in so many ways worthy of emulating. And one of the strange things about the times that we're in is that we cannot celebrate a person's life together uh, in, a, in, a, in a memorial service or in a funeral service. And so we wanted to just close our worship service this morning by providing all of us an opportunity together as a faith family to celebrate Ike's life. And so uh, you may not know this, but one of Ike's favorite uh, worship songs was, uh, was the song Mighty to Save. And so we're going to close worship today with Mighty to Save. We're going to worship God through that. We're going to worship God in that song in memory of of, of Ike and Sharon too, because his wife Sharon was so beloved to so many of us. So we're going to close worship just uh, by remembering uh, Ike and Sharon this morning.
joining us for worship today. We look forward to having you join us again next week. Don't forget to fill out the e-connect card. And also be sure to post those photos of your family worshiping together on your personal Facebook page. Don't forget to tag GCF Vineyard of Wilmore as well as to use the hashtag GCF Worship. Below you'll see that one of our staff members is posting a link to our prayer ministry room. If you've joined us for the live feed, then you can click on this link and you'll be automatically redirected into our private Zoom rooms where one of our prayer ministers will be happy to pray with you. Thanks again for joining us. See you next week. My song will be the same. Sing it out. Oh, Christ be magnified. Just let his praise arrive. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified in the altar of my life. Christ be magnified. One time, sing it out. Oh, Christ be magnified. Just let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Sing it all. Oh, Christ be magnified. From the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. Come on. You are-